Okay, Ambassador Ross, well, I think with your, with your permission, we'll begin. Uh, quite a few more people have joined us and we'll probably get a few more people joining us along the way. Uh, first of all, thank you and welcome to everybody uh, to our event tonight where we're lucky enough to be hosting Ambassador Dennis Ross. Uh, before I introduce our speaker, just a few words on the Cambridge Middle East and North Africa Forum, uh, the organization of which I'm the co-founder and co-president, which will be hosting the event tonight. Uh, we're a think tank based out of the University of Cambridge, uh, focused on studying the international relations of the Middle East. Uh, other than speakers events, uh, like the one we are hosting tonight, we have a number of exciting projects, which I encourage everybody to get on Facebook and check out our website in order to learn a little bit more about. Uh, one of our exciting projects is a journal called Manara, uh, published out of the University of Cambridge. Uh, we accept submissions on a rolling basis and are currently putting together our next edition, uh, which will be focused on reflecting 10 years back since the Arab Spring. Other than that, we're engaged in a number of policy research projects. Uh, we're currently working on one regarding the future of Libya, as well as the future of leadership structures in the Middle East. And other than that, we have a news update service published on a weekly basis every Monday. Uh, we're a team of about 15 language and regional experts put together an analysis of the events which transpired over the course of the past week, uh, as well as give those interested in the region a heads up as to what might be worth looking out for uh, in the week ahead. Uh, those are just some of the projects that we're engaged in, but we always have different things going on. And like I said before, I encourage everybody who already doesn't uh, to follow us on social media and check out our website. Uh, in terms of tonight's event, so we're lucky enough to have with us Ambassador Dennis Ross. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with Ambassador Ross, and excuse me for giving just a brief introduction, uh, because if I had to get into all of, all of his illustrious work experience, that could be an event in and of itself. Uh, but Ambassador Ross is currently the William Davidson Distinguished Fellow at the Washington Institute for Near East Policy in Washington. He also currently teaches at Georgetown University Center for Jewish Civilization. Uh, for more than 12 years, Ambassador Ross played a leading role in shaping U.S. involvement in the Middle East peace process, dealing directly with the parties as the U.S. point man on the peace process in both the George H.W. and Bill Clinton administrations. He also served for two years as a special assistant to former President Obama and National Security Council Senior Director uh, for the Central Region, as well as as a special advisor uh, to Secretary of State Hillary Clinton. Ambassador Ross is the author of five books on the peace process, the Middle East and international relations, most recently in 2019 publishing Be Strong and of Good Courage, How Israel's Most Important Leaders Shaped Its Destiny. Uh, regarding our event tonight, uh, we're going to open the event uh, with Ambassador Ross's statement, after which I'll ask a number of questions which I've prepared in advance, after which we'll open the floor to everybody for questions and answers. In terms of logistics, everybody who enters the event is on mute. Uh, if you'd like to ask a question when the question and answers come, we'd love to hear your question. Just push the button on the bottom that says raise hand, uh, after which we'll lower people's hands and unmute them uh, based on the order in which the question was received. Uh, we just ask that the question be focused uh, and that the question be an actual question and not a statement uh, just in terms of being conscious of everybody's time. Um, we anticipate the event will run approximately an hour and 15 minutes, uh, hopefully finishing at 5.15 UK time. Uh, without further ado, thank you again, Ambassador Ross, and thank you to all of our uh, esteemed guests for joining us tonight. Uh, thanks for having me. Uh, I look forward to our conversation. Uh, I will try not to go on too long to begin with. There obviously are lots of different issues I could be raising right now. And the Middle East is characterized as usual by not only lots of different conflicts, but also I would say lots of different moving parts. Just in the last week, we've seen uh, an event in, in Jordan, which raises questions about how to think about Jordan right now. Uh, but rather than, than deal with that per se, what I'd rather do is take a step back and offer a brief kind of conceptual view that may provide more of a context for our discussion. So let me, let me kind of frame this in terms of what it is the Biden administration inherits as it 
begins its administration. And we're obviously in day 75 in administration. So these are, these are just still the early days of the administration. It's an administration that doesn't have a deputy secretary of state yet confirmed, doesn't have any undersecretaries confirmed yet in the State Department, has not even nominated many of the assistant secretaries, which is not unusual at this point. Typically, assistant secretaries, like the assistant secretary for the Near East Affairs Bureau in the State Department, would be unlikely to be uh, in position until May or June. So we're still in the early days. And in, in a sense, what I'd like to do is offer a kind of brief conceptualization of what they face. Well, what's the first thing they face? Well, they face several conflicts in the region. Uh, Syria is, is obviously an ongoing conflict, probably 600,000 dead. More than half of the population has been displaced, either internally or externally as, as refugees. Uh, the, one can read about the horrific conditions in which those who are living in the Id Idlib area uh, are faced with, the uh, truly horrible humanitarian circumstances, the difficulty of getting assistance to them. Uh, this is a conflict where the Russians, the Iranians are involved, as are the Turks. Uh, Turkey has carved out certain areas, both in the, the northwest of the country, the northeast of the country. It has now a zone there. Uh, the US has two small places where it has a military presence. Uh, and there are those who would obviously like to see the US withdraw that presence, the Biden administration at this point is not doing so. Uh, the risk of escalation as it relates to this conflict continues because Israel sees Iran determined to engage in a precision guided project. What I mean by that is Iran has provided well more than 100,000 rockets to Hezbollah. It provides uh, rockets uh, into Syria as well. What the precision guided project is about is putting terminal guidance on the rockets that have been provided. Up until now, these are rockets without terminal guidance. They're guided by sort of inertial guidance, meaning they're shot up in the air, they reach their high point, and then gravity takes them down, so they're not precise at all. But if you can put terminal guidance on them, uh, then suddenly those rockets from an Israeli standpoint become a dramatically greater threat. Their current layered missile defense permits Israel to, in a sense, discriminate among those rockets that it would have to shoot down uh, versus those that would just be falling in areas that uh, nothing of, you know, there aren't people living there, there aren't strategic targets there and the like. So Israel views this as a fundamental strategic threat and it is continuing to carry out uh, attacks into Syria to blunt this. The Iranians are working to create more of a capability with Lebanon itself with Hezbollah. Uh, and at a certain point, if once Hezbollah acquires enough of these kits and acquires more of an indigenous capability to actually develop these kits, uh, you could easily see at a certain point that Israel feels the need to strike into Lebanon and Hezbollah has made it clear if they strike into Lebanon, uh, Hezbollah will, res will respond. This is a kind of war that you can see how it starts. It's not so easy to see how it ends. Uh, and it's also an illusion to think that Israel might be taking more than 2,000 rockets a day in such a war uh, and leave Iran off on the sidelines untouched, meaning this is a war that might not only escalate vertically, but also horizontally. So that's one conflict that the administration is going to be facing. And it has some stake in trying to again, limit the risk of that escalation. A second conflict uh, is Libya. I noted you, uh, you, you're gonna have a discussion on Libya. Uh, the good news about Libya is that there actually does seem to be a tenuous ceasefire that is holding. Uh, the good news is that there is an interim government. It'll be interesting to see whether that interim government really will fix a date uh, for preparing a constitutional elections. In the meantime, here again, we have the Russians and Turkey involved in the outside, from the outside. Uh, we have them providing arms, uh, even though the agreement for this, uh, for, the, for the ceasefire is based on the premise that uh, arms and forces from the outside should be removed. There's no prospect at this point that either one of those is actually happening. Uh, we know Libya is important because it's also the jumping off point for lots of refugees going to Europe. This is too, once again, it's a conflict with external involvement, with potential for 
an escalation involving the neighbors. Uh, and so this too is something that confronts uh, the, the Biden administration. Third conflict is Yemen. Uh, and it is interesting that the Biden administration uh, in uh, coming in, it reversed the, the terrorist designation of the Houthis. Uh, it has made it very clear it's not gonna provide any military logistic support for the Saudi campaign in the Yemen. Uh, the Houthi response to this so far is to up the ante dramatically. Uh, I would say coming into this year, the Houthis might fire five attacks during the course of a month into Saudi Arabia. Those attacks right now are up to about 30, meaning they're carried out almost daily. And when I say attacks, it's not a single drone or a single cruise missile or a single ballistic missile. Uh, it can be swarms of them. They have dramatically increased the scope of their attacks, both in terms of their quantity and in terms of the targets they're hitting. Increasingly, they're, they're targeting oil facilities. Uh, the Saudis have declared a unilateral ceasefire, but by the way, ceasefire that the Biden administration endorsed. Uh, as I said, the response by the Houthis so far is to up the ante, in no small part because I think they think they can create a set of realities on the ground that will dictate what the outcome is going to be. Here again, you know, you have the potential for escalation. Uh, while the Israelis are not admitting it, they, the Iranians have a ship, the Saudis, which was uh, attacked uh, with mines attacked to its hull. This is a, a ship of the Revolutionary Guard. Uh, it is a command control ship. It is an intelligence ship uh, related very much to the conflict in Yemen. Uh, this sort of what amounts to the attacks on ships uh, is taking what was a shadow conflict between the Israelis and the Iranians out of the shadows and more into the public. Here again, we see the risk of, a, of escalation. So that's one set of challenges that the administration faces. But against that array of challenges, it also looks at the landscape where there are three different groupings uh, in the region now. So one grouping is Iran and the Shia militias uh, that it uses as an instrument uh, and it's, those instruments are quite prominent, give them leverage in Iraq, uh, in Syria, obviously, uh, in Lebanon through Hezbollah, and in Yemen with the Houthis. By the way, for those who say the Houthis are completely an independent actor, uh, free of the, of the Iranians, the Houthis are now uh, threatening that they, they may attack Israel. Uh, it's hard to see how the Houthis launching drones against Israel serves any interest that they actually have, because uh, Israel could respond if in fact they do this. These are drones that are also being provided by the Iranians. So when I talk about the first grouping of Iran and the Shia militias, clearly we see a kind of prominent role for those groups that are prepared to pursue Iran's agenda throughout the region. What is noteworthy about where Iran has a kind of prominence and leverage in Iraq, in Syria, in Lebanon, and in Yemen, these are all either failing states or a failed state. Hardly a testimony to Iran creating a model that could be a source of attraction to others in the region, but that's grouping number one. Grouping number two is what I would say is Turkey, Qatar, and the Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, I, I want to flag this as a grouping uh, in part because I want to answer those who say the conflicts in the region are basically Sunni Shia. No, they're not Sunni Shia. They may be based on competing power interests of local countries, but Turkey and Qatar and the Muslim Brotherhood, they're all Sunni. Uh, and, uh, and they're not they're not fighting the Iranians. Uh, there may be some competition in some places, there's cooperation in others, but this is a grouping uh, that basically, uh, I think it hues very much around Turkey at this point uh, and Erdogan's uh, interest in, uh, in extending the Turkish influence in orbit. Uh, Qatar is part of this because of its own efforts to kind of present itself as a bridge builder between different sides, but certainly it has connections to the Muslim Brotherhood. 
Uh, Turkey, by the way, has a military presence now in Iraq, uh, northern Iraq and northern Syria, uh, in Libya, uh, in Somalia, uh, and a presence in, in Qatar as well. The third grouping is what I would say a number of Sunni Arab states with Israel. And it isn't all the rest of the Sunni Arab states, but it's clearly the Gulf states. It's Egypt, it's Jordan, it's Morocco. Uh, and there is in fact a convergence of interest here. Now this grouping uh, is, is one that I think began to emerge more because of common threat perceptions, but also with what was the perception of an, a declining American interest in the region, the potential for American withdrawal from the region, uh, it created not just more of a sense of commonality with the Israelis, at least below the radar screen, uh, but it also created a sense that Israel could be a bulwark against the threats that many of these states see, them, see themselves facing, whether it's the Iranians, the Shia militias, or it could be ISIS, Al-Qaeda, uh, and even the Muslim Brotherhood. So you, you look at the level of security cooperation that Israel has with Egypt and Jordan, which is, again, mostly invisible, but also unprecedented in terms of its scope. But you also see a level of Israeli uh, security intelligence cooperation with many of the Gulf states as well. Now, this was this convergence started off for security reasons. But we've seen with the Abraham Accords that it has emerged much more in the open with at least uh, four other Arab states. Uh, and I would say this normalization process is significant uh, in the sense that it, it also responds to something that these states need. I wanna make one point about, maybe two points about this and then I'll, I'll pause because as a long time negotiator and mediator, I have the capacity to go on for a very long periods of time, not take a breath and not repeat myself, uh, in which case uh, I will have a dialogue, but it will be a monologue and you won't have a chance to weigh in. So I'm gonna give, I wanna wrap up so that we actually have a chance for your questions. Uh, but I wanna make a few observations about this, this last grouping. First, the convergence of interest began some time ago. I wanna put in perspective the, the UAE and Israel as, a, uh, as an example. The, their relationship began quietly going back to the end of the Bush administration. Uh, I can tell you at the, at the very beginning of the Obama administration, February of 2009, uh, I was invited to a meeting uh, with the UAE ambassador. Uh, and when I showed up for the meeting, who was there? The Israeli ambassador to the United States. Uh, and this was February 2009. And the purpose of the meeting, the, the message was in the meeting itself. They wanted to talk about Iran. And this was a signal, look, we're working closely together. Maybe we're not, maybe it's not visible, but we're working closely together. This was 2009. In 2015, the Emirates allowed the Israelis to establish a presence in the International Renewable Energy Agency in Abu Dhabi. They had a formal diplomatic presence, not to the UAE, but a presence nonetheless within Abu Dhabi because uh, the International Renewable Energy Agency uh, was where the Israelis then had diplomatic representation. Uh, starting in 2017, uh, there were athletic competitions like in judo where Israeli athletes were allowed to participate. Israeli ministers were invited before COVID uh, and uh, the planned 2020 Expo in Dubai. Israel was going to be allowed to have their own pavilion and Israelis were going to be allowed to travel there on their own passports. This was before normalization. My point here is what started off as purely a security related endeavor began to transform itself. Uh, and there's a, a non-security dimension to this relationship. The Abraham Accords were adopted uh, and allowed, in a sense, had the UAE cross a threshold. It was kind of a glass ceiling to this cooperation. It wasn't formalized. It wasn't full normalization, but there was a process of normalization. What triggered the Abraham Accords was actually the UAE making a move. Uh, in July of 2020, the UAE approached the White House and Jared Kushner and basically said, look, we can give you a win. We will do a, a formal peace treaty with Israel. Uh, it'll be the first one since 1994 between Israel and Jordan. 
but there, there's two conditions. One, no Israeli annexation of the territory allotted to it under the Trump plan. Uh, and two, we get weapons provided to us that we have sought but been denied uh, because the U.S. has a commitment to preserving Israel's qualitative military edge, but you approach that differently for Arab countries that are at peace with Israel than those with Arab countries that are not. So meet these two conditions, we'll fully normalize. But this was, in a sense, creating a culmination to a process that had been underway for more than a decade. Uh, now, the, the reality is many of these Arab states see Israel today as being able to provide needs and services that are important to them in terms of governance. Uh, when it comes to water security, you know, Israel is a leader in, term, in the world, not only in drip irrigation, but also it's the leader in the world when it comes to the reuse of wastewater and the treatment of it. Israel reuses 90% of its wastewater. I think Italy is the second closest in doing that and they're at like 17%. So there's a to help in terms of expansion of water resources, to help in terms of food security. Israel has developed drought resistant crops, uh, to help in terms of cybersecurity, uh, to help in terms of dealing with health problems. So there's a whole array of issues that many of these states themselves under greater pressure in the aftermath of COVID can see that cooperation with Israel serves. That's point one. Point two, uh, it's a reversal. We're seeing a reversal of, the, of what was the, the sequence in the Arab Peace Initiative. Go back to 2002, the Arab Peace Initiative offered Israel formal diplomatic relations, but only after Israel ended occupation. There wasn't necessarily the promise of trade and commerce and tourism, but there was a promise of formal diplomatic relations conditioned first on Israeli full withdrawal. Now, what the UAE has done, then followed by Bahrain and Sudan and Morocco, uh, is basically say, no, we will meet our needs first. Now, in the case of the UAE, uh, they said, okay, no normalization. Uh, in the case of the other states, they were addressing their needs with the U.S., but it didn't stop. It isn't stopping the process of their normalization with Israel. The point here is these are countries that are putting their own interests and national needs first, and they see that the relations with Israel can help there. They don't see the Palestinian issue as something that necessarily is now a priority. Now, it doesn't mean they disregard the cause of Palestine. In the case of the UAE, after all, they said no, no annexation. But clearly, it's a, it is a reduced priority, and it is not an issue that will determine what they will or won't do vis-a-vis -vis the Israelis. Uh, the interesting question will be how that applies to others, uh, and we can get into a discussion about that and what, it's, what the prospects are and what we might see. A second point I want to raise about this, however, is what we see is a loss of fear as it relates to the Palestinian issue. Historically, there was a concern that the Palestinians on their own or with others could mobilize great opposition to any country that would move towards normalization. Now look, recall in the case of Egypt, when Sadat, after Sadat goes to Jerusalem and Sadat makes peace, uh, the Arab League office was withdrawn from Cairo. Egypt was ostracized by the rest of the Arab world. That was led by Saddam Hussein, who organized a, a summit in response to it. Uh, the, the reality that the Palestinian issue was such a mobilizing issue, such a source of great passion, and that anyone who would seem to be defying that in, in, in pursuit of their own interest would pay a price, and the price could involve political destabilization, a threat to the regime. That fear is gone. It is interesting that when the UAE uh, concluded its agreements with the Israelis and the Palestinians sought condemnation of it at the Arab League, they were rebuffed. They sought condemnation of it at the Organization of Islamic Cooperation. They were rebuffed. They went to the head of Al-Azhar and sought at least condemnation there. They were rebuffed. So the, the, the fear factor here uh, has obviously, it's not just a reduction in priority of the Palestinian issue, it's that there is not the Palestinian capacity to organize uh, and mobilize in a way that creates, gives pause to, to these leaderships. Um, the readiness to even be critical of the Palestinians in public is much more prominent than it was in the past as well. So I, I say this to sort of set the stage for our discussion. 
Uh, we have a region with new grouping. We have a region where they're enduring conflicts. Those conflicts can escalate. We have a region where normalization is part of the landscape now, a new part of the landscape. Uh, and I'll conclude with this thought. I understand why the Palestinians in particular see normalization coming at their expense, but they need to, they need to stretch their own thinking because normalization can actually be used in their service. And what I mean by that is follow the logic of what the UAE did. They said, okay, no normalization. If, if there's annexation, stop the annexation. Uh, we will normalize. A country like Saudi Arabia could say to the Israelis, we're prepared to take a series of steps towards you in public uh, that leads to full normalization, but we would like some parallel moves by you towards the Palestinians. Uh, the US could actually effectively broker uh, these kinds of steps. And I can give examples of the kind of steps that could be taken. The point is normalization doesn't have to come at the expense of the Palestinians. It actually can be used as a vehicle to break the stalemate between Israelis and Palestinians. On their own today, the Israelis and Palestinians, the gaps are greater than they've been at any time since I've been working on this, which is a pretty big statement to make. The substantive gaps, psychological gaps are profound. The level of disbelief between Israelis and Palestinians has never been greater. Uh, so if you wanna break the stalemate, it needs to come, I think, by taking advantage of that normalization process and, and what exists in terms of the existence of that third grouping. Okay, I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Ross, for those really, really interesting opening opening comments. We certainly have quite a lot to discuss in the time that we have uh, allotted. Uh, before we begin our conversation, I just wanted to acknowledge the presence of uh, a number of esteemed guests who joined us during the course of the opening remarks. Uh, we have with us uh, Baron Simon Isaacs, the fourth Marquess of Reading. Thank you for joining us. We have with us as well the uh, Baroness Deitch. Um, and I also noticed that we're lucky enough to have with us uh, the deputy Israeli deputy ambassador to the United Kingdom. Uh, and finally, we have Dr. Matt Godwin, uh, who's a special assistant to Lord Mendelssohn on Israel and Middle East issues. So thank you to everybody for joining us. Um, I'll begin with, I think, what's more of a macro question, and then we'll drill down to the to the micro. Uh, and it, it kind of feeds off of one of the one of the things that you mentioned and the theme I think which has been following a lot of the conversations that we've been having at the forum uh, related to American involvement in the Middle East. Um, and for the purpose of the question, I'll refer back to quite a high profile article uh, that former ambassador Martin Indyk published last year in the Wall Street Journal, uh, where, I mean, the title very obvious very obviously gave away the message and it was the Middle East, Middle East isn't worth it anymore. And the comment was that very few vital US interests still actually exist in the region. And the point of the article was really to encourage this and maybe to warn of um, an American disengagement from the region. Um, interestingly enough, very much in line with the message that we heard from the Trump administration uh, who had a repeated pledge, and I'm taking Israel out of the equation for a second, uh, but who had this repeated pledge of, you know, ending American involvement in the Middle East. Um, so two, two questions. Uh, the first is, what are your own personal thoughts? Um, is this, you know, really the case that American interests in the Middle East, you know, both in terms of oil and in terms of other geopolitical interests are not really the same as they once were? Um, and also it will be interesting to hear as somebody who served in the Obama administration, uh, what you believe our expectations should be from the Biden administration uh, in this department. Uh, happy to address both. Uh, highly relevant questions, especially because I think these are also issues that are still being thrashed out here uh, in the state. Um, there's no question that the kind of the imagery of the endless wars have had a profound effect here within the country. Uh, it creates a, a kind of instinct to withdraw from the Middle East. When I say the endless wars, I'm referring not only to Iraq, but also Afghanistan as part of, as part of the greater Middle East. And there's no question, there's a sense that the US engaged in, in these wars. These were wars that came at enormous cost, both in terms of blood and treasure, and the region looks worse off, not better off for us having been there. So 
you know, what's the point? And Martin's article was the, the I have to say the, the title of the article created an image that went a little bit beyond the actual content of the article. My own view is that we still have interests in the Middle East. Uh, if you put the President Biden's objective of climate change and responding to it, uh, creating renewables, uh, if you put that as, a, as such a, a very high priority, it means you still have an interest in Middle Eastern oil because you've got to transition from where we are to that point. Uh, ironically, if the price of oil dropped too much, it would make relative to that renewables more costly. You actually want a stable, predictable price of oil to make it easier to do the transition away from oil. Uh, big disruptions in the Middle East, therefore, can, can be quite problematic uh, in terms of the impact on your on priorities related to creating renewables, uh, your interest in preserving in, in generating continued economic growth, uh, the effect of, of the world's economy and how our allies are doing. So we still have a stake in a kind of predictable supply of oil at predictable prices, number one. Number two, uh, one thing we know about the Middle East is that the pathologies of the Middle East, they never stay there. We have, you know, there's a, in this country, there's something called the Las Vegas rules. The Las Vegas rules are what takes place in Las Vegas stays in Las Vegas. The problem is the Las Vegas rules have never applied to the Middle East. What takes place in the Middle East never stays in the Middle East. Uh, the idea that we don't have much of a stake there. Uh, look at the impact of the, of the refugee flow out of Syria. Look at the impact it had on the EU. I think in no small part, I'm speaking to people in the UK, in no small part, I think it had a big effect uh, on Brexit. Uh, so we have to be mindful of conflicts in the region and how they have a way of, of spilling over and spilling out and, and generating uh, refugee flows. Uh, we have a, we still have an interest in terms of preserving non-proliferation there. Once again, because this is, if this becomes a proliferated region, uh, the kind of wars that could be fought again will have an effect well outside the Middle East itself. Uh, terrorism is also something that creates an ongoing interest there. I could go on in terms of identifying what are the reasons we still have an interest in the Middle East. So that's point one. I, I can't help but also tell a, a brief story about this. So going back to Bush 41, uh, during a transition period, I was, uh, I was running the part of the transition for Jim Baker when he's gonna become Secretary of State. I was, I was either giving uh, presentations to him about what was in the Soviet Union and the Middle East or organizing them about the whole array of issues he would be facing. So on the Middle East, I was about to start the presentation and he said to me, in what can only be described as famous last words, you know, I want to be a successful Secretary of State and the Middle East is, is a way to guarantee I'm a failing Secretary of State. Uh, so I'm not going to be, I'm not going to fly around the Middle East the way George Shultz did. Of course, he flew, ended up flying around the Middle East much more than George Shultz. I said to him at the time, you may think you can ignore the Middle East, but the Middle East won't ignore you. And we're getting a pretty good indication of that even now not only because of what's happening in the region more generally, but the Iranians are working, have, have worked to force the administration to have to deal with them. They put themselves on the agenda by ratcheting up what they're doing in the region, but also by ratcheting up what they're doing in terms of their nuclear program to force the administration to have to deal with them. Uh, so uh, from my standpoint, I think we have to, we have to have a strategy for the Middle East, even if we want to be if we want to reduce the scope of our involvement, and the Biden administration right now is going to reduce its military footprint uh, in the region. Uh, it, its instinct, again, is not to make the Middle East a priority. Its instinct is to focus on the restoring the U.S. as a good global citizen, restoring America's alliances, making clear that America will lead again, but it wants to show with its allies that to sustain our leadership, Others are going to have to assume greater responsibilities and share a greater part of the burden. Uh, and, and part of their logic and part of the argument is, you see what happened over the last four years. If you want us to be able to sustain a leadership role, which is important for everybody, we need you to do your part. 
this is also, this can be a message to the Middle East as well, especially to America's partners in the Middle East, that the U.S. can do more, but it, but what's required of them is that they do more. And here there's a kind of, I would say, mutually reinforcing process, because the the more that these countries can do together, the easier it becomes for the U.S. to rationalize it's playing a certain kind of role. Uh, anyway, the, in, in answer to your question, I think the instinct of the Biden administration is to reduce the priority, but the, what I'm trying to get at is the Middle East has a way of imposing itself whether you like it or not. Uh, and I suspect the administration will find it's not so easy uh, to downplay the Middle East too much. Ignoring it isn't a possibility. Finding the right mix, the right level of our involvement to ensure vacuums aren't created, which will then be filled by the worst forces, that's going to be the challenge for the administration. And again, it's 75 days in, it's extremely early. Most of the people who will be in, uh, in confirmable positions are not in those positions yet. So the administration is still very much just in its, in its early days. Thank you. Thank you for that answer. A very, very relevant answer. And I guess, as you said, still early days and, and we'll see where things, uh, where things indeed progress to. Um, I want to touch on the Iran issue, which of course interests, I think, everybody here and is something which you, which you mentioned as well. Um, and I'm just going to briefly quote just a sentence from a recent publication of yours uh, at the Washington Institute, uh, where you said, if regime change is not a realistic or advisable goal, the objective must be one of changing the Islamic Republic's behavior. While this would be difficult, history shows that regime change will make tactical adjustments with strategic consequences when it considers the price of its policies to be too high. Now, I think it was in February, if I'm not mistaken, uh, we saw the Biden administration rescind former President Donald Trump's UN sanctions uh, that were imposed on Iran. Although President Biden himself has, on the one hand, uh, said pretty clearly that the United States will not unilaterally lift sanctions uh, in order to get Iran back to the negotiation table, there have been rumors uh, circulating about all kinds of proposals to ask Iran to halt some of its nuclear activities, uh, work on advanced centrifuges and enrich only up to 20% um, in exchange for all kinds of relief from the United States economic sanctions, alongside, of course, the informal talks that we see going on in Vienna now, uh, which does anything but you know, apply a maximum pressure campaign to the Islamic Republic. Um, the question is, is it really only a maximum pressure campaign um, that is required in order to be able to bring Iran back to the table? Uh, and if a maximum pressure, pressure campaign is required, what value is there in partially list, lifting sanctions, partially renegotiating nuclear deals, and even holding informal talks in Vienna? Isn't that signaling the exact opposite message of perhaps what, according to your article, uh, we'd like to be signaling to the Iranians? Um. Again, a very fair question. Uh, I, I guess the way I would answer it is the following. There are those who say maximum pressure failed because it didn't change the Iran's behavior. Uh, I would say uh, maximum pressure had an effect on Iran, but it didn't have the desired effect. It's also most of the critics of the, of the JCPOA uh, including the Israelis and the Gulf states, will say you have leverage on Iran. Once you get back into the JCPOA, what leverage will you have? The administration has an answer to that. Uh, and the administration doesn't buy the maximum pressure approach, at least rhetorically. But as you correctly noted, the administration has not lifted any of the sanctions unilaterally. What it did at the UN, what the, what the Trump administration said was, it's time to do snapback because the Iranians have violated the agreement. The problem is they made the case as someone who had already withdrawn from the agreement and they were therefore not treated as a participant any longer in the agreement. Uh, so uh, the point is, it's not that, the, not that the, the Biden administration has reversed the sanctions, they haven't reversed the sanctions. They simply said, snapback doesn't apply, but they haven't lifted any of the sanctions either. Now, the, what the administration is trying to show is that it won't make any unilateral concessions. What the Iranians are insisting on is because the U.S. withdrew from the JCPOA and imposed all these sanctions on Iran, 
that somehow the administration needs to move first and owes the Iranians. This was completely predictable. Uh, the administration is trying clearly to create a kind of package where it is no longer, it's not making who goes first the issue, it's making the question of having a package set of understandings where we will lift sanctions, uh, but they will reverse all the areas where they have transgressed limits. Now, by, I should just note, parenthetically, there is one area where they can't reverse, they can't undo what they've done. They can undo, uh, they can roll back the amount of, of enriched uranium they have on hand that exceeds what they're permitted to have. They have about 12 times the amount uh, of stockpiled now of low enriched uranium that they're permitted to have. They now have, uh, I just saw, they now have 55 kilograms of 20% enrichment, which is they were, 20% you know, represents the dividing line between low and high enriched uranium. So that they can reverse. They can, they can reverse uh, the numbers of centrifuges they have operating that exceed the number they're permitted to have. Uh, they can stop enriching uh, where they're not supposed to be enriching in Florida. They can stop doing that. All those things they can, they can, they can ship out the excess amount of enriched material they have. Those things they can reverse. What they can't reverse, they now have four cascades of advanced centrifuges that are anywhere from five to 20 times as efficient uh, as, the, as the IR1s that they were using. Now, when I say they can't reverse it, they weren't permitted to deploy any advanced centrifuges until the year 2025. Now they have four cascades, which they have been running. What that means is they have developed all sorts of know-how, experience, uh, working through the bugs. These advanced centrifuges are highly delicate machines that they have basically figured out how to operate. So they are four to five years ahead of where they're supposed to be. That's not reversible. That's a new baseline. Uh, somehow that should be part of the equation. I'm not sure that it is, but it should be part of the equation. So what's the best way to proceed? My own preference had been what I call the less for less deal, meaning don't require them to reverse all their moves. In return, we don't lift all of the nuclear related sanctions. And the reason for preserving the sanctions regime is to preserve leverage for dealing with them. The administration says it wants to get back to JCPOA and use that as a platform to then negotiate a longer and stronger JCPOA, JCPOA 2.0. Uh, that I think is a, is a worthy objective. The administration still has to answer how it will preserve its leverage to be able to achieve that. Now it makes an argument. The argument is, Look, one of the things that Trump showed is that when we adopt sanctions unilaterally, we can apply it at least on the private sector internationally, and they'll and they'll observe if they know that they if they do business with the central bank of Iran, they can't do business with us. Uh, what we saw is that capital is a coward, and the banking system internationally, private sector internationally, they stopped doing business with Iran. So. What we can do is we can basically say, uh, if the Iranians don't reach, if we don't reach an agreement with the Iranians on a 2.0 JCPOA by let's say 2023, when the sanctions regime is supposed to be permanently revoked as opposed to only suspended, when the Iranians are supposed to take to their parliament and have their parliament ratify the additional protocol, uh, if we don't have an agreement by that point, we will reimpose the sanctions again. Now that does have the potential of preserving leverage. Uh, and the interesting thing will be if the Iranians make all sorts of threats at that time, will the administration proceed with the threat? That's a question mark. But at least they have an argument for how they can preserve leverage to try to get a follow on agreement. There is a failing though with this argument as well. So let's say between now and 2023, uh, one instead of do the Iranians have to change any of their behaviors in the region? The answer is very little, uh, unless the administration is prepared to adopt a position, which we don't know at this point. 
Will the administration compete actively with the Iranians in the region? If you want to deter the Iranians, you're going to have to raise the cost to them. So I guess what I'm saying to you in answer to your question in a long-winded way uh, is that there has to be a balance here of having leverage, but also uh, leaving the Iranians a way out. Now, there's a reason I think the administration has wanted to get back into the JCPOA, and it reflects a concern that if they don't, that Iran is on a march towards having a nuclear weapon, and either Israel will act to preempt, and therefore you have a conflict, or we may feel driven to it. Again, bear in mind that one of the things that when he was running, President Biden said was he would ensure Iran never has a nuclear weapon. Now, if, the, if, we, if you can't get back into the JCPOA uh, and, the, and the Iranians won't accept an alternative to it, uh, then you look at the potential of conflict going up. I think what's really driving the administration is the desire, let's put the nuclear issue back in the box. We'll try to negotiate something. We can figure out how to deal with the rest of what Iran is doing, but it'll be much harder to do that if we're under the gun uh, because they're moving closer and closer, not only to a breakout capability, but to the potential of them being able to present the world with a nuclear weapons fait accompli. We can't let them get to that point, or Israel won't let them get to that point, and then we'll have a conflict. So I think to understand the administration's approach, that's why they want to put the nuclear issue back in the box. The challenge for them, which was embedded in your question, and I think in, in, in how I've tried to answer it, is how do you preserve your leverage so you can get a follow-on agreement? And even as you try to do that, what are you doing to prevent what they're doing in the region, much less what they're also doing with their ballistic missile program? So that was a very comprehensive answer to a very complicated question that I'm sure we could continue talking about for the rest of the evening. Uh, but it definitely shed, uh, shed quite a bit of light on the, uh, perhaps the strategy behind the current administration's expected policies. Um, I have quite a few more questions, but just in the interest of letting everybody else also ask, um, I'll just ask one more brief question and then we can move to questions and answers. Um, and for this question, I'll also uh, go back to a, a quote of yours uh, in relation to Jordan. And you said, we should always be concerned about what happens in Jordan. Jordan's position has been pivotal uh, and its connection to stability is essential. Now, I want to specifically refer to the recent events in Jordan. Uh, and what I'd be interested in, in hearing about, and this is not necessarily only in relation to the recent events, but it's been highlighted by the recent events, um, is how Israel has been critiqued for not doing enough to contribute to Jordan's internal and also external uh, security, um, and also been critiqued for not really considering the Jordanian position enough. Uh, we've seen that specifically in relation to the Temple Mount and all kinds of timely flare-ups uh, in relation to you know, princes being, uh, their visas being denied, when they plan trips to the Temple Mount and the issue with the metal detectors, uh, which were placed without the Jordanians being informed that led to quite an explosion in diplomatic relations. Uh, and to go back as far as trying to assassinate Khalid Mashal in Amman in the middle of the day uh, without really considering what that would mean you know, for the king. Um, how concerned at this point do you think Israel should be about what happens in Jordan internally? Um, what really is the relevance of stability in Jordan to Israel's own security? And what, if anything, can Israel do to contribute more uh, to Jordan being safe and stable? Um, I'll put it this way. Israel's longest border is with Jordan. If Israel doesn't have a partner in Jordan that is determined to keep that border safe and secure, Israel faces dramatically higher risks in terms of dealing with its security on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, the fact that Israel can count on the professionalism of the Jordanian military, on extremely close coordination with it, especially as it relates to border security, is a huge pillar uh, in Israel's security approach, but also a pillar in terms of its security doctrine. Uh, and uh, Israel has been able to completely count on the Jordanian military when it comes to protecting that border. So that's huge. You know, if, if this was a front for Israel, imagine that then it's facing Hezbollah in the north, uh, Hamas in the south, 
and who knows what's uh, to its east. So, you know, ask anybody in the Israeli military, do they have a stake in Jordan? And the answer is going to be a resounding yes. Now, the good news is that the, the level of cooperation between the security establishments is extraordinary, notwithstanding the tensions at the political level. There's real tensions between Prime Minister Netanyahu and King Abdullah. Uh, and it's, it was compounded by when you had the, uh, the killing at the Jordanian embassy by an Israeli guard. He killed an attacker, but he also killed someone who was trying to come to his, his defense uh, and deal with the attacker. Uh, and the Jordanians allowed him to leave. And then with an understanding this would be, you know, he would be kept very discreet. And then the prime minister chose to give it great prominence. So that caused a lot of anger on the Jordanian side. Um, the, the fact is, there used to be a kind of troubleshooting relationship between the two. Uh, and that, you know, the, the people who represented who were part of that channel, uh, you know, are no longer operating. There should be, again, a kind of troubleshooting channel between Israel and Jordan because the relationship is so important to both. Uh, there's a lot of, the Jordanians have a lot of complaints on their end. Uh, you know, there was supposed to be an agreement on the uh, dead Red Canal uh, and the Israelis made a decision uh, to walk it back. Uh, so there's, there's, a, there's been a buildup of tensions over time. The good news, as I said, is the security establishments have operated as if those tensions did not exist. Uh, now, obviously, it serves both interests for that to be the case. Israel can do more in terms of helping Jordan when it comes to water. Uh, and it should do more when it comes to that. At the end of the day, though, stability in Jordan is very much a function of what the Jordanians do, not what Israel does. Israel can help along the margins, which is useful, but we shouldn't have an illusion that somehow Israel is in a position to determine whether Jordan is stable or not. That depends upon what happens within Jordan. I think it's very important for the U.S., given the fact that we are now the largest donor in terms of assistance to Jordan, we should be working with the Jordanians more in terms of helping to focus on what is it that, that Jordan needs to be doing right now to contend with what are, are really very large problems. You know, COVID has hit Jordan extremely hard. One of the biggest sources of hard currency is tourism. So that whole industry was basically devastated. Uh, so you have a country that lost one of its main revenue sources, you have a country that, you know, does get help from the IMF, but it comes with at a high cost in terms of uh, what Jordan's macroeconomic approach is. Uh, it imposes a kind of austerity, which in many ways adds to near-term problems. So there are things that can be done. There is a need for economic reform in Jordan. Uh, there clearly is a need to deal with uh, signs of corruption in Jordan. Uh, there are things that we can be doing with Jordan to help them on both these fronts. Uh, and we, the US should be doing that. That's an American responsibility. That's not an Israeli responsibility. Israel, as I said, can help when it comes to water. It's, people don't even know the scope of what Israel does in terms of helping Jordan deal with some of its security problems. Just as Jordan plays uh, an extraordinarily important role in terms of protecting the border, there are other threats that Jordan faces that Israel is actually, that Israel helps on. I won't get into that. So Israel, I think, you know, it does play a very positive role, at least in the, what I call the functional areas. Politically, uh, there, there's been needless tension and that should be removed. Uh, you know, at a time when Turkey is trying to displace their Jordanians, you know, in the, in, uh, and the role of the waft in the holy places, it's not in anybody's interest. Uh, and so again, I think we, we should also be working maybe in trilateral ways with Israel and Jordan to overcome some of the political tensions that have existed. Thank you. Thank you for that answer. And thank you more generally for, for all of these comprehensive answers to my questions. Uh, we're going to move on to Q&A from the audience. And I see we already have one question from our executive vice president and the editor of our Manara journal, Naman. 
uh, just to remind everybody, uh, you're on mute. So if you'd like to ask a question, there is a button on the bottom where you can raise your hand. And once I see that your hand has been raised, I'll call on you in an orderly fashion and unmute you to ask your question. Uh, Naman, I'm unmuting you now so you can ask your question. Hi, so um, I wanted to ask about Syria actually. So at the same time that Israel has been normalizing relations, some of the Arab countries, some of these same countries have also been normalizing relations with Syria, UAE, Kuwait, Bahrain. And we've also seen some European countries who have expressed interest as well, Greece, Hungary, and others. And uh, the US has of course been quite opposed to this. I'm curious if you think the US should um, perhaps reopen or at least re-engage diplomatically directly. And um, similarly on the uh, impact of sanctions on third party states, especially since the MRIs have expressed an interest in wanting to participate in reconstruction in Syria. Um, you know, foreign policy is often, when you're making it, you're confronted with dilemmas. You never have easy answers. You never are faced with, here's the obvious choice that is all good, and here's the obvious choice that's all bad. Uh, at one level, it is very hard to rationalize dealing again with Assad. Uh, what he has done in Syria is an abomination. He's unquestionably a war criminal. Uh, on the other hand, as you noted, we have friends like the UAE have reestablished their diplomatic relations uh, with Syria. Uh, and so how do, you, how do you square these two realities? It's not a it's not an easy answer. Uh, I think the key is to have a broader objective in mind. Uh, if you go back to, I think, Security Council Resolution 2254, it talked about a transition period of 18 months. It talked about the drafting of a new constitution and then having elections. Uh, one thing that Assad has demonstrated is he's not prepared to make any concessions at all. Uh, I think you know, the question becomes one of, under what circumstances would the Russians really support this resolution? They voted for it, but will they support it in practice? You know, this, this is one of, this is also, again, you put all these issues in a larger context. What's the overall US-Russian relationship? Uh, what the Biden administration has made clear is areas where the Russians are doing things they shouldn't be doing like intervening in our elections, uh, like with solar winds, uh, engaging in a, in a scope of hacking that uh, cyber warfare that is unacceptable, we're gonna impose a price. But that doesn't mean that there aren't areas where cooperation could also make sense. Obviously on Iran, we have an interest in cooperating because we do have a common interest. Russia doesn't want Iran to have a nuclear weapon either. So where we have the potential for common interests, we ought to see what can, we can do. Syria is one such place. For me, by the way, I don't believe the Russians have the means. I, when I say I don't mean, I don't believe. I know the Russians don't have the means to force Iran to leave Syria. No way. They do have the means to put pressure on Iran. They can do it directly and indirectly. When they give Israel a license to carry out these attacks against the Shia militias and the Iranian presence in Syria, that's a way of putting pressure on the Iranians. Now, the question again is for us to explore what are the Russians willing to do in terms of a real political process in Syria? To date, they've not been willing uh, to walk away from Assad. There was a period about six months ago when they were critical, open, they were allowing some of their media to be openly critical of Assad. Uh, was that just a tactic to try to put some pressure on him? I suspect it was. But I, I think there is value in at least having a conversation with the Russians now about saying, okay, look, we have areas where we're competing, but this is an area where we don't necessarily have to compete. But we also are mindful there's a legacy here where Russia agreed to certain things and then didn't implement them. If there's a readiness to proceed in Syria where there'll be actual implementation, we could work with them. The lever we have is they, they would like to see the small forces we have uh, in Altanaf and, and also uh, in the Deir Azor area or near there uh, where they don't want us to be. Okay, that's something that could be traded away. You're not going to walk away without them demonstrating actions, but this is part of what could be a conversation 
And I guess for me, in terms of dealing with Syria, that's where I would put the focus right now. But thanks for the easy one. <laughs> Thank you for that answer. We have a question now from Tom Walsh. Uh, Tom, I'm going to unmute you so you can ask your question. Great. Thank, thank you for the talk. It's been fascinating. Um, so I sort of look at the Saudi-Iranian sort of conflict in general, the kind of Cold War, as I like to call it. Um, I was just interested in what you're saying about reproachment and the prospects that might have the Palestinian cause. Um, but you also said that Palestine is no longer the priority for many of the Gulf states, including Saudi Arabia. Um, it's, it's not a priority, but it's no longer the priority, I think you said. Um, can you understand why the Palestinians are anxious uh, about the relationship in the sense that if, it's, if they're no longer the priority and the priority seems to be anti-Iranian sentiment between Israel and the Gulf, and Iran is an ally of Palestine and the Palestinian cause, why they might be understandably sort of anxious about that relationship? Well, I understand completely why they're anxious. Look, from, from a Palestinian standpoint, they say they see themselves as the weakest player. Uh, you know, they're obviously divided. And that's that's their responsibility. But they see themselves as the weakest player. They they wanted they want to use they, historically they wanted to use the prospect of normalization as a lever on the Israelis. Okay, if you address what we need in terms of ending occupation, then you can have normalization as your reward. Now they see what they felt was the main, the main lever they had taken away from them uh, and, and without consultations with them. So I understand their position. What I was trying to get at is, I believe they can turn this to their advantage. Uh, and, and I see it as the one truly new dynamic in the region that at least from a US standpoint, we could play with. If I were doing what I used to do, I know exactly what I'd be doing. I would go to the Saudis with a menu of steps that they could take towards the Israelis and discuss them and say, and then find out from them, okay, if, if uh, let's say that, that you were gonna open a trade office in Israel, uh, what, would you, what would you want the Israelis to do towards the Palestinians for that? And we could discuss what that might be. And then you go to the Israelis and say, okay, look, we can cross this threshold with the Saudis, but, for them, they want you to take a step uh, that makes it easier for them with regard to the Palestinians. Let's talk about what that might be. Now, obviously you'd walk through with the Saudis what the options would be, you'd walk through with the Israelis, but you'd also talk to the Palestinians because if there are steps that Israel takes toward, towards the Palestinians that are meaningful, the Palestinians can't just be in a receive mode. They also have to take some steps. And that's what I mean, that's how you break the stalemate between Israelis and Palestinians. Uh, so that's why I think that normalization is something that can be used in the service of Palestinian interests. Uh, and I do believe there is below the, let me put it this way, I speak to a lot of Palestinians now, and it's very clear to me that even some elements within the PA's leadership are open, more open to thinking this way. The, the politics and the politics among the Palestinians right now is quite complicated to say the least. So again, some of these things have to be sorted out. We haven't even talked about the Israeli political process, which um, I never thought I would say that Israel was gonna try to emulate the Italian approach to elections, but it looks like they're doing a really good job of that. Uh, so, you know, we have to, we have to sort that, that, have, that process still has to be sorted out. Uh, we don't know if we're gonna have an election uh, on May 22nd uh, in the West Bank and Gaza, we'll see. So those, that represents, I think, you know, the, there is something that can be done here. Just on the, the Saudi Iranian uh, cold war, as you put it, which sometimes expresses itself in not such cold terms, um, it's not gonna go away anytime soon. Uh, they really have a kind of zero sum perception of each other right now. Uh, and uh, it's, I don't believe it's an accident that the, as I've said earlier, the escalation of the Houthi attacks, both in number and in terms of the, the targets, uh, you know, it's hard to believe that doesn't reflect some 
Iranian push in that regard as well. So, you know, look, the, the approach to the region needs to also focus on how you affect Iran with regard to that. But at the same time, if, you, if you're deterring the Iranians from that, does that then create some basis in which to, to create some functional areas of cooperation? You know, look, the Iranians are gonna have, they're not immune to the effects of, of drought as a result of climate change. And in their case, because of mismanagement of their water resources, they're in a terrible position. For, over the coming decade, for Iran to be able to sustain its population given its water shortages is gonna be an insuperable problem. Uh, so, you know, we should be focusing on, we're not, we're not gonna get them to suddenly make peace with each other, but they have some common interests. I mean, some are very basic, like right? how do you manage the Hajj? How can you cooperate on that? But, you know, is it possible to cooperate uh, on climate issues? Are there functional issues where both sides have a need, uh, where cooperation becomes possible? And I think that's, you know, in the context of increasing deterrence, you can also focus on, okay, what could be some things that would be done that the Iranians would also see as being to their benefit? So that, that's kind of the larger point I've, I've been trying to make today. Thank you for that answer, Ambassador Ross. Uh, our next question is coming from Dr. Malik. Dr. Malik, thank you for uh, thank you for joining us and thank you for your question. I'm just going to unmute you now so you can ask. Thank you very much, Flomo, and thank you uh, for the great talk. This has been a, a uh, very uh, illuminating and uh, very um, very good, very good, excellent talk. Uh, I just wanted to touch on the issue of Libya. Now, you have pointed out that um, these uh, crises in the Middle East, um, they are, uh, there are three crises, Syria, Yemen, and Libya, and probably adding the situation in the Gulf um, to that. Do you think that the American, American administration is um, uh, approaching these crises simultaneously at, uh, with, with the same level of interest and, and effort or um, dedication, let's say, I don't wanna say dedication, but like effort in towards solving these issues. And as these crises seems to be interconnected because they are involving the regional powers, um, are they, or is there a higher priority? Is Libya now is the probably lowest priority on, on the agenda for the new American administration? Would, would the American administration give uh, other powers such as European Union or France, like a leeway towards like um, probably um, uh, having having a more kind of a bigger role into the political, like uh, trying to solve the political problems in Libya. Um, would other regional powers be given a, a role into, um, you know, into this crisis or would the United States be actually uh, trying to lead the, the efforts uh, again in Libya and try to settle the crisis there. Um, thanks. Uh, it's an interesting question. I think the instinct of the administration uh, is to first want to demonstrate that we're back in the diplomatic business, meaning we will be engaged in diplomacy in all these areas. I don't think when it comes to Libya, there's a sense that we need to be the one leading the effort. Uh, I think there is a sense that we should be involved in the effort, but in many respects, and, and you know, and that's sort of, I think, embedded in your question, the Europeans have a much higher stake in what happens in Libya than we do. Uh, and, and I think there's probably a recognition of that, but I think there's also, again, just the concern, each of these conflicts has this potential for escalation. And I think that's where the administration sees a need for its involvement, uh, but, it's, but it doesn't mean we have to be the lead. Uh, look at look at in Yemen, we appointed uh, an envoy, but the envoy's role is to work with the UN, mark, you know, work work with uh, the UN envoy at the same time, and so they're they're working very closely together. I think the same thing would apply in Libya, uh, where whomever gets sort of designated to assume that responsibility will be from the State Department. Will probably not be, again, these envoys are not high-profile envoys. They're not, they're just, 
I mean, not to, I, I, want, I, I can connect it to the way envoys existed in the Clinton administration. You know, so Richard Holbrook was the envoy for the Balkans. You know, he was invested with, uh, with a great deal of authority. He had an interagency team. Um, you had Bob Gallucci be the envoy for North Korea. Again, invested with a great deal of authority. I was the envoy for the Middle East. I used to joke when people said, does President Clinton always know what you're doing? I said, he always knows what I'm doing. Sometimes before I do it, sometimes after I do it. I mean, all of us had a, a license to be able to operate and we were perceived as being invested with a lot of authority. I don't see, other than Rob Malley on Iran, I don't see any of the people who are being appointed as envoys as being, in a sense, uh, having that kind of interagency authority. Each of us commanded our own interagency team. The only person who may have that authority is Rob Malley. Uh, and, uh, and nobody else in the administration seems to. Not because I think they're not trying to engage in diplomacy, but I think there's an effort. They want, they want the assistant secretaries, again, to take a kind of lead responsibility. And the envoys will work very closely with the assistant secretary. Part of this is they want to downplay the image of the Middle East as being a priority. And I guess what I was trying to suggest up front is they may find it's not good enough to work that way. You may have to give your efforts a higher profile because if you're going to give, if you want others to play a certain role, they're going to have to see a level of American investment of at least political capital. Uh, and if you don't have an envoy of high enough stature, they won't be taken seriously enough. It won't look like the U.S. is really involved in a way that commits it. So I think this is, as I, I tried to imply, I think this is a work in progress for the administration. And I think what we've seen, we shouldn't draw conclusions about this is where they're going to end up being. Because it's so early in the administration, they have so few of their people confirmed uh, that you really can't draw a, a conclusion about how much they will invest. They will end up investing. Right now, the investment is low, uh, but it's too soon to make a judgment about is is that really going to be the the scope of the investment or not? Thank you for that. Uh, thank you for that comprehensive answer. And the Libyan. Uh... The Libyan issue is one which actually is it's quite fascinating and not really on everybody's radar as much as it should be, unfortunately, uh, considering the wide range of other things happening in the region. But having learned quite a lot about it recently from uh, our involvement in the project on Libya that I mentioned briefly, um, it really is something which uh, it will be interesting to see the direction that the current administration takes as well as their interface with the with the European Union uh, and other regional powers on the on the issue. Um, so that's all the time we have for this evening. Uh, I also did not see any more questions in the audience. I could, of course, go on and and keep asking questions, um, but I think we'll we'll call it an evening for now. I wanted to say thank you to Ambassador Ross for taking the time out to address our forum tonight, and thank you to our esteemed guests for taking the time out to join us. Uh, for those of you who might have joined in the middle and missed my pitch for the Middle East and North Africa Forum, uh, I encourage everybody to check out our website and also have a look at our social media. We'll soon be publishing our lineup of speakers events uh, for Easter term, uh, which will go live in the next week or two. Uh, we also have our Manara Journal, which I mentioned earlier, which we accept submissions for on a rolling basis. And we also are happy to compensate our researchers for submissions. Uh, and we accept submissions from students, from professionals, from academics uh, on a wide range of topics. So please check out our call for submissions on the website. Other than that, we have quite an interesting and I would say useful news update service, which is free to subscribe for, uh, available on our website. You can sign up there, comes out every Monday and really is a great overview of the different things happening in the region. Uh, and gives you a brief understanding of what it is you should look out for in the coming week and month. Uh, thank you again to everybody for joining and we look forward to seeing everyone at, uh, at future Middle East and North Africa forums events. Thank you again, Ambassador Ross, and we look forward to staying in touch.
Okay. Bye-bye. Thank you. All the best. Thank you.